Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV, and we are continuing our Philippines week. And I don't know about you, but I've been absolutely loving it. And uh, again, because we're at a different time of day from our new normal presentations, if you're a first-time viewer of a live show, welcome aboard to World War II TV. And as always, all the information you need is in the description below. You can find out information about how to support the channel, merchandise, and links to my guests' books and websites and projects and things like that. But without further ado, I'm going to bring my guest in. Albert Labrador is a photographer by trade, but he's one of those enthusiastic World War II history buffs that we like to bring forward on the channel. And again, thanks to my friends over there for putting these people together. So good evening, Albert. How are you today? Uh, doing good. How are you? I'm very well. So we've been talking before going live, but you know, you're one of those people, sort of broadly speaking, the same kind of age group as me. You know, World War II is an interest. Where did it start for you? How, how, how did you interest in World War II begin? But like a lot of people in our our generation, uh, our parents uh, took us to see the movies. Uh, we, there were a lot of World War II movies that I saw with growing up. We had the uh, <laughs> Battle of the Bulge, uh, D-Day, uh, The Longest Day, and all these TV shows. Um, and from there, it kind of grew. My father got me into scale models. Uh, and because of that interest, I was, uh, I was reading up on a lot of World War II history. Our grandfathers would tell us a little bit about it but i was actually more interested in the war in europe the, the <laughs> my interest in the war here uh is a more recent thing actually but that that's fascinating and I've, I've had that before where people have been living in one part of the world interested in the battlefield the other side of the world but have an own their own battlefield outside but for some Absolutely. reason that's Absolutely. not the one that interests them i yeah. live in normandy but i've always been fascinated by the battle of arnhem so that, that there's a weird disconnect there but the other thing, question I want to bring up to you, which I've asked to Ronnie yesterday, is, you know, with a population of over, well over 100 million in the Philippines, and it's 80 years in the past now, World War II, as you travel around the country taking photos, how aware are the people you meet of World War II generally? Is it something people do talk about? Is it long ago in the past and forgotten? I'd be interested in your perspective. Uh, it's an interesting question because it's got a lot of answers to it. Um, when you travel around, people are aware that World War II happened because in our uh, grade school and high school yearbooks, uh, World War II is covered, but um, very much like the Japanese, the war is covered in one or two pages of the history right. books. Um, but it's interesting in a way because uh, when we put up exhibits and things like that, I, I once had a grade school kid walk up to me and define what War Plan Orange 3 was. So, I mean... Uh, you will find people who are interested. You'll find people, uh, obviously, there are a lot more people who aren't interested. People are aware of it, but don't know what it's about. Yeah, thank you for that. And it's what we've been also been talking about is the idea that for someone like myself, my information about the Philippines has been filtered through the U.S. version of the history. You know, everything starts and ends with MacArthur. It starts and ends with American forces there. And as Ricardo said on the first day, you know, the, the number of Filipino defenders in 1941 far outnumbered American defenders. The influence of the guerrilla uh, com combat throughout the war that John McManus brought up is something that we don't necessarily hear about or we do hear about. We think of it as the Americans leading you. Whereas mm -hmm. John McManus was very much saying it was in any way, if, any, if anything, it was the other way around. It was Filipino right. guerrillas giving information to the Americans, you working right. as, as equal partners. But anyway, we're talking about, you know, that 41, 42 period. And as we discovered with Ricardo, that despite the fact the beaches, uh, the, inv the, in the, the initial invasion met with unfortunate great success by the Japanese, as the, 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 the campaign continued, the terrain sort of favored the defender a bit more in land. And we're going to talk about some of those, those instances there. So I'll bring up your PowerPoint. And folks, um, you know, fire away with questions as we go along and at the end. But I'm going to hand over to my guest, Albert, to take us through this sort of five-day odyssey, but also talk a little bit about the terrain and the conditions and, and get that insight from someone who lives there. So, so over to you, Albert. All right. Good evening, everyone. So tonight's talk is about um, uh, Skinny Wainwright. Uh, Wainwright was known as Skinny to, to his friends and uh, his men. Um, he was an old, hard-drinking cavalryman, very popular with the men. Uh, he had a drinking problem, apparently. Uh, General Marshall actually uh, was uh, thinking that sending him to the Philippines was a good thing because he wouldn't have to worry about this uh, this general, and he was actually due for retirement. Um, the interesting thing about this campaign is because here in the Philippines, a lot of people talk about Bataan, and a lot of people talk about the Death March, but this precursor to Bataan actually uh, 
made the stand in Bataan what it was uh, without Wainwright's uh, retreat into into Bataan. Uh, actually, it was Wainwright and General Parker from the South. Uh, the Bataan campaign would never have had happened, uh, and it could have very easily have turned into a rout. Hmm. So anyway, um, let me get right into it. Um, so the viewpoint here is from two units that I've been following and reading books about, and uh, basically the two units that were actually driving a lot of the drama uh, so to speak, going on during this five-day retreat. And those two units are the 26th Cavalry Philippine Scouts and the Provisional Tank Group uh, of the U.S. Army. Okay, so this are these. Uh, this is a photo of uh, the 26th Cavalry Philippine Scouts. I'll get. Uh, I'll say a little bit more about them later. And uh, this is one of the newly arrived tanks of the 194th Tank Battalion, part of the Provisional Tank Group. Okay. So let's look at the Philippines. If you were a uh, witness to Rico's talk, um, we have an archipelago of over 7,100 islands. And one of the first things that you notice is that if you have a nascent army, newly formed, which was the Philippine army in 1941, there is no way you could defend this coastline. Um, there was no navy. Uh, the United States Navy was nowhere near. Uh, it had been hit at Pearl Harbor. There was no one coming to the rescue. And quickly, um, it appeared that uh, the crux of the entire campaign would be fought on Luzon. Now, uh, we're going to be going back to this map a lot later on, right? And this is the map of uh, the central Luzon plain seen... Um, from the north, you can see Lingayan Gulf, where the Japanese landed, yep. and MacArthur would land later on. Um, to the south, where you have Manila, here at the very, very bottom, you can see um, Manila just peeking out there. And you'll notice on the left and right of this central plain are the Zambales Mountains and the central cordillera. Okay, So this is basically a funnel through right. which any invader will pass. Um, Lingayan is a protected gulf. Uh, it's a cove. Um, it's not open to as much weather as the rest of our western coastline is. Um, and uh, the other thing was the ja there was no way the Japanese could have uh, entered via Manila Bay because, um, as you'll find during Tony Ferredo's talk, uh, Manila Bay was protected by the guns on Corridor. So uh, the Japanese first landed in the north uh, above Lingayan Gulf. Uh, to, number one, uh, try to establish an airfield, and number two, to act as a feint to draw Filipino forces up so right. that they could be rolled up as the invasion force arrived in Lingayan Gulf. More about that later. Okay, so this is the kind of terrain that you'll see on the central plain of the zone. Uh, this is actually the old Fort Stotzenberg. This is where Fort Stotzenberg was. Uh, it's right beside Clark Airfield, Clark Air Base. Which is still, uh, which is now an international airport, um, and it's still a very important airport uh, to the Philippines. Now it serves uh, it serves Manila. It's a secondary airport to Manila, but it has always been um, one of our most important airfields. So the United States had uh, positioned um, several B-17s there. They had uh, several pursuit squadrons there. Uh, basically. Um, Clark Airfield had uh, the greatest American projection of air power uh, in the world. Okay, so um, unfortunately, when the Japanese hit on December eight, nineteen forty-one, which was like you know just a few hours after December seven, yep. December eight is December seven, uh, December seven is December eight. That confusing here. date line that, yeah. that, 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 that screws everybody up. Yeah. Um, Basically, what happened was uh, the Americans virtually lost their air force. Uh, General Sutherland had gotten in the way of uh, MacArthur being informed and being asked to, to fly the B-17s elsewhere to protect them or actually bomb Formosa. Now, we'll never know if that was a good thing or a bad thing or if it mm. would have worked. But in the end, uh, most of um, American air power in the Philippines was destroyed in Clark Field on the first day. Okay, so 
let's go to the uh, provisional tank group. The provisional tank group was moved to the Philippines, was formed actually um, in 1941. Um, and this was a National Guard unit. It was not a regular U.S. Army unit. Um, it came from small towns, uh, Salinas, California, Brainerd, Minnesota, Harrisburg, Kentucky, uh, Port Clinton, Ohio, Maywood, uh, Janesville, Wisconsin. So these are um, small town suburban guys who uh, grew up together, went to high school together, uh, knew each other's families, right? And all of a sudden, they were equipped and sent off to uh, defend the Philippines. So the uh, provisional tank group was equipped with the relatively new M3 Stewart tank. Uh, it was a very me mechanically reliable vehicle, um, equipped with a 37mm gun. Um, it had thin armor, but it was adequate. If you've seen uh, videos, I wish I had a link, of... Uh, Stewards moving forward at speed, they were incredibly fast and very, very nimble. Uh, so there are two units in the provisional tank group, the 194th Tank Battalion and the 192nd Tank Battalion, um, companies A to D. And each battalion had um, 54 steward tanks, which is pretty impressive strength mm. at the time. Now, um, assignment in the Philippines used to be uh, a job that people in the U.S. military looked forward to. Why is that? Because the Philippines was supposed to be a tropical paradise. It was like the Paris of the East. Um, labor was very cheap. As an American serviceman billeted in the Philippines, you could hire a shoe shine boy, someone to clean your house, someone to press your uniform for you, um, and so on and so forth. So um, what's this? Being posted in the United States was seen as something like a, uh, a sought-after job. Not only that, you had parties uh, with uh, the Manila nightlife and other such things. Okay, So um, the, the provisional tank group was there to uh, bolster um, the Philippine army, which was just forming, uh, which had just begun to form in 1935. It was the first act of, uh, of the Philippine government to form the Philippine army. And MacArthur was hired to uh, be its commander. Now, um, the Philippine army just composed of one regular division, just one regular division and 10 reserve divisions, modeled somewhat like the um, American National Guard units, where you would be regionally formed, uh, go through several months of training, and be ready for call-up at any time. Uh, MacArthur was planning to have these Philippine divisions ready by mid-1942, but the war got in the way. Now, um, in addition to the Philippine Army, you had the Philippine Department, which was uh, United States Army units. There were two Philippine scouts, Scout regiments of infantry. The, the Philippine Scouts was formed by the U.S. Army during the Philippine-American War. Uh, basically as a local force to defeat, um, to defeat insurgents and irregulars uh, as a sort of, um, well, it's, it was not the constabulary, but it was a separate unit formed uh, so that the United States Army would have a sort of foreign legion here in the Philippines. Um, being part of the Philippine Scouts was a matter of pride to many people. Um, first of all, the... Uh, the, the salaries were higher than normal. Um, uh, the training was good. You got uh, good billeting. They took care of your family um, and so on and so forth. Uh, as a matter of fact, as Rico said the other day, uh, there are families that have several generations in the Philippine Scouts. So mm. it was a matter of pride. Now, the most important um, unit as far as our story is concerned uh, was the 26th Cavalry Philippine Scouts. The 26th Cavalry Philippine Scouts was uh, a horse cavalry unit um, composed of several troops. I, I think it was Troop uh, A through F um, of horse cavalry. But then by 1941, they were already converting into some mechanization. They had um, M3, M3 scout cars uh, to provide reconnaissance, liaison, communications, and transport. Okay, so we have uh, two units we're talking about, uh, the Provisional Tank Group of Stewart Tanks and 
the 26th Cavalry Philippine Scouts. Just to interrupt you, Albert, with a question. Do we know whether any real thought had been given to implementing this kind of armor within the specific terrain of the Philippines? Because when you were talking, I was thinking about the show I did a long time ago about the Italian armor of World War II kind of being designed in the 30s to kind of combat an assault over the Alps and the mountains. And it had been specifically, yeah. that's why they use light, fast moving tanks that, you know, that can go out past. Was, was there any uh, sort of thought given to that? Or was it that was the tanks the Americans had? That's the tanks they got and they'll just use them. I mean, it, yeah, because it's the, one of those. Sorry. Standard issue. So yeah. uh, it was the standard issue light tank of the Americans. They didn't have a medium yet. They had the M2 medium, but that was rather archaic in design. Um, that said, uh, the Philippine Central Plain that we saw in the aerial shot yeah. earlier is um, ideal tank country. The only thing that gets in the way of tanks there are rice paddies, uh, yeah, okay. which uh, we'll see later were dry at that time of the year. Um, okay, so uh, Back to you. Sorry. 26 Cavalry. Let's talk about the 26 Cavalry. They were led by Americans. Uh, Philippine scout units had American um, officers, many of them who had seen action Earlier on in the Philippines, uh, Wainwright himself was a cavalryman in the Philippines. He served in the Holo campaign in Mindanao, uh, in the counterinsurgency campaign. Um, Clint Pierce was also a, a veteran cavalryman who had served here, uh, as well as in the Mexican campaign. Okay, so um, this is a pre-war photo of the 26th Cavalry Philippine Scouts. You can see here with their, uh, you can see them here with their M2 uh, scout cars. By the beginning of the war, these scout cars had been replaced by um, the more advanced M3. Um, they were no longer using swords at this time. Uh, so the, the, the key weapons of a Philippine scout cavalryman were uh, a 45 caliber pistol, M1911, and his Garand rifle. Uh, a lot of people don't know that the Garand rifle was first used in the Philippines. Um, it equipped all of the Philippine scout infantry units and the cavalry. Uh, so basically, you would have a scabbard on the right side of your horse uh, carrying your M1 rifle. Uh, also, the uh, US 31st Infantry uh, was equipped with uh, early versions of the Garand rifle. All right. So um, these two units... Uh, were a minority. If you talk to a lot of people, they will tell you that while the Philippine army was not well trained and was not prepared for war, uh, despite this, the Philippine army did most of the fighting and most of the dying. And uh, huge sacrifices were made by these guys who had hardly even been trained. Um, in addition to the tanks, uh, the Americans also sent something new. This is a T-12, which is um, a prototype version of what later on became the M3 GMC uh, gun motor carriage. Uh, the gun is an old French 75, uh, which could fire eight rounds a minute. Um, again, I wish I had put up a video because these things can go really, really fast. The Germans used them as well, and 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 the Italians. It seems all sides uh, were equipped with this World War One gun because it was still uh, a pretty decent design by this time. So basically, the T12 is a um, is a French 75 mounted on an M2 half track. And the interesting thing here was um, the combination of the crews. Uh, the gun commanders were American, the drivers were Philippine scouts, and the gunners were Philippine army men. So you had all three services uh, operating these, these things. Uh, there were, um, yeah, there were three, four battery battalions, and these figured very heavily in the fighting because uh, the M3, with its 37mm gun, did not have um, high explosive rounds. They only had um, mm -hmm. armor piercing. So these would make very, very good support vehicles. And we're it's used. interesting you talked about the diff, the makeup of the crew there because it's come up in our Tank Destroyer week. Every army is having this debate about who operates what 
these type right. of vehicles? Are they yeah, artillery? They are they armor? <laughs> are they infantry support? What is yeah. a tank destroyer? Should be should be. It's like the Armageddon film. Do you train uh, um, astronauts to become oil uh, diggers, or do you train oil miners to become astronauts? Right. And the same thing applies here. Do you use artillerymen? Do you use tankers? Do you use infantry? And it's it's interesting that even in the Philippines, this debate is raging about exactly what these units should be, who should be running them. It's a, it was a universal dis uh, uh, debate happening across the, uh, the globe at this point. The very strange thing about this combination is, unlike a lot of things, it actually worked. Uh, <laughs> you'll find it later that they were very, very efficient. And they did really great service. Okay, so, uh, yeah, that's another D12. All right, let's go to the Japanese landings. Um, most histories will tell you that as the Japanese landed... Um, the Filipino soldiers simply broke and fled because uh, the divisions that were manning the beaches, the 11th, the 21st, and the 71st, were not uh, the first regular division that was well trained. Um, if you look into, if you look into the records, you will find that um, some of these Philippine divisions actually managed um, to ambush uh, Japanese as they were coming ashore. The um, the Japanese were ambushed at, uh, I believe, the Tanaka, uh, the, the Ta Tanaka Detachment was ambushed uh, north at San Fernando Point. Um, but eventually, uh, being untrained, these troops were steadily overwhelmed by, uh, by the Japanese. The Japanese, after all, had air support. They had uh, ships firing from offshore, and uh, they were arriving in... Uh, great numbers. Um, the Japanese, uh, when they finally landed at Lingayen, had 43,000 troops um, uh, as part of uh, Homa's 14th Army. So 43,000 troops came in, coming ashore against uh, three barely trained divisions. Uh, so what will happen will happen. Um, the, Philippine, uh, the Philippine soldiers were also able to fire back with counter-battery fire from those same um, T-12 units and 75mm um, guns doing some damage to the Japanese, but eventually they were overwhelmed and a lot of the units broke and started um, to retreat southwards. So when this happened, um, Wainwright, who was given command of the Northern Luzon Force, uh, the first thing that came to mind was to send uh, his elite unit forward and uh, that would have been the 26th Cavalry Philippine Scouts. Uh, a pretty light unit, but it was a unit he was um, confident in. Uh, he also asked for tanks. The tanks were not under the command of Wainwright. The tanks were under directly under MacArthur and General Weaver, the uh, commander in chief of the, the the commanding officer of the uh, of the provisional tank group. And um, interestingly, Wainwright got the same kind of answer from General Sutherland that uh, MacArthur would not, he would not release the tanks uh, to Wainwright. Uh, this got corrected after a couple of hours. Um, Sutherland himself called and said that, yes, that he was receiving um, 15 uh, tanks from the 192nd uh, Tank Battalion. Uh, in the end, he actually just got five. Right. So uh, this is an actual photo of one of the uh, provisional tank group stewards heading up to the front. Um, interestingly, uh, during the Japanese air raid on Clark, uh, before uh, the Japanese landings, um, one of the... Uh, one of the company officers of the 192nd Tank Battalion um, had a nervous breakdown and he was replaced. He was a captain. He was replaced by a lieutenant. Um, so the initial Japanese landings were to seize airfields and uh, feint to draw uh, Philippine Army forces, which worked. Um, the Northern Luzon Force under Wainwright had four Philippine Army divisions, three of which were at the beaches, uh, and the 6th Cavalry. Parker in the south had two Philippine Army divisions and the 194th Tank Battalion. Homa's 14th Army landed at Lingayen with 43,000 men. MacArthur calls uh, Marshall up and says the Japanese have landed 100,000 men. Now, I don't know if he was passing information that he got on the beach or he was trying to build things up when he realized that um, the beach defenses were untenable. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. So after some initial success uh, with the artillery, the Philippine divisions began to break. Uh, the, the divisions uh, fled south and east, and both the 192nd uh, Tank Battalion and the 26th Cavalry were called up north. Uh, three SPMs, uh, the self-propelled mounts were destroyed on the beaches. Uh, and on 22nd December, Wainwright himself um, got into his Packard uh, staff car and took a trip north to see exactly what was happening. Um, Wainwright was what you call a soldier's general. He always wanted to be at the front. He wanted to see what was happening. He wanted to uh, build up morale. And he was always found going back and forth mm-hmm. uh in front, his um, his cavalry commander, uh, Colonel Pierce, was uh, very similar. He would always be driving up and down the front lines in a motorcycle in a Harley Davidson. Uh, it kind of reminded me of uh, Meyer's book in uh, Normandy. You always see him uh, on a motorcycle with, uh, yeah. with, yeah. with a ribbon drop riding behind him, right? So, uh, yeah. Um, Wainwright was initially blocked by Sutherland, but the uh, the tanks were released to him. Okay, so, so a quick now question let's... for you, Mark, before we, you can carry on. So this is this is summing up a couple of things that have come up in the sidebar about that this this the plan basically focusing and hoping that they would they would stop them on the beaches, as Rommel was to say four years later. So Peter O'Connell is asking: the Japanese quickly overran U.S. Philippine forward supply caches. Did the U.S.s anticipate the need to establish separate supply weapons caches across the island to support guerrilla ops? I mean, guerrilla ops obviously come later, but even in the immediate aftermath, there not there had not really been a plan to kind of have fallback positions, had there? Well, the sad thing about it was uh, there was there were weapons cached, but they right. were not fully. They were not uh, fully cached and they were not fully available. The Philippine government had food supplies that were not released uh, to the U.S. Armed Forces Far East. Um, And because there was a sudden change from defeat them in the beaches to withdraw to Bataan, a lot of these supplies along the way were uh, just wasted. Um, As a matter of fact, in Fort Stotzenberg, a lot of the supplies were either just handed out to whoever was there or they were destroyed. Um, okay, so the march to the Mortis. Um, the tanks moved up to the town of the Mortis, uh, close to where the Japanese had landed, and they already at the very first uh march towards uh Pangasinan uh suffered a few a few mishaps. Um, one of the drivers on the M3s discovered that he was night blind and he had never driven at night in a tank. <laughs> And so uh, they lost one of the tanks driving it off the road. Um, another thing that the tankers had trouble with, which was interesting to me, was that Philippine roads at the time were like British roads uh, driving, on the, uh, driving on the left, whereas American tanks drove on the right. And so uh, the tankers had problems with that. Now, Lieutenant Ben Morin uh, was assigned to lead the first attack against the Japanese, and he took five uh, Stuart tanks uh, on recon towards the Japanese landing beaches in, uh, in the Mortis. And um, he was the lead tank, so he had a large uh, number one painted on his tank, and he was very concerned about that because with a white one on your tank, it should probably make an easy aiming point. Um, the men in the four tanks uh, following uh, Morin uh, all knew each other. They were all from the same little town. Um, so they ad- advanced 100 yards apart towards the Japanese positions, turned north upon reaching the Mortis, seeking out the Japanese. Um, and Ben Morin decides, maybe I'll fire a trial shot with my 37mm gun. These guns had never been fired Uh the tanks were not allowed to fire or did not have time to try firing uh, since they had arrived in the Philippines in September. He fired one round of 37mm and immediately jammed his gun. Apparently, the guns had not been uh, given uh, fluid for the recuperators and basically he turned, into, he turned it into a machine gun tank. Um, so he did not see the Japanese or the beach as he was driving down uh, to the Mortis. Either it was uh, high hedgerows on either side or jungle. Uh, he didn't even see the beach. Uh, mm-hmm. They encountered a scout car from the 26th Cavalry on the way and he asked 
where the Japanese were, and they were told half a mile down the road. So as uh, Ben Morin's M3 uh, went up the road uh, to the Mortis, followed by the four tanks, he was attacked by Japanese uh, tanks that were in position that were advancing uh, south to pursue the Philippine uh, Philippine infantry divisions. And Ben Morin's tank was shot, uh, was hit uh, at the driver's uh, position where you see that little open flap on the left side. Yep. Uh, tearing off the driver's hatch. A second shot tore off uh, the rest of the entrance of the di driver. So Morin had the, the tank slewed to one side to protect uh, the entrance so they could repair it. They stepped out to repair it, but um, the Japanese kept on firing and the tank caught fire. Um, as the tank had caught on fire, the, the tanks behind him assumed that they had all been killed and drove past to uh, encounter more Japanese tanks. Meanwhile... Um, they thought uh, they were able to turn the fire. They, they were able to use the fire extinguishers. Fire went out. And uh, they didn't know that their, um, the tank had been hit by a Type 95, by a Japanese tankette. It, was, it collided with the Japanese tankette. And uh, his sprocket, his, I think his right sprocket was removed. And the tank could only spin around. So it spun around for a couple of, uh, for a couple of turns and ended up in a rice paddy. Uh, a dry rice paddy, thankfully, uh, and the crew waited there under Japanese fire. Eventually, wow. the four tanks went right past him after they came under attack by the Japanese. All of the tanks were disabled. Um, the second tank behind Morin uh, was hit, and the uh, the machine gunner, the radio operator, was decapitated. Uh, so that was the ignominious start for uh, U.S. tank operations in World War II. That was the wow. very first... Uh, um, tank encounter that the U.S. Army had in World War II. Um, they would get paid back later on. Okay, so all the tanks retreated and uh, they were abandoned at the Mortis because they were no longer uh, they were no longer repairable. Uh, whereas uh, Morin and his crew were captured by the Japanese. Uh, they were hogtied and placed on the rear decks of Type 95 tanks. And the thing that chilled him the most was an English-speaking Japanese officer told him, you are not prisoners, you are captives. As we know, the Japanese were not uh, signatories to the Geneva mm -hmm. Convention. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the 26th Cavalry also moved at speed. Uh, as a matter of fact, this is one of the, probably the only uh, photograph taken as the Cavalry moved north. Um, and uh, they had... Uh, they had basically the same role uh, that the tanks had, was to seek out the Japanese and attack them. Um, the 26th Cavalry fought as dragoons, uh, basically. So what would happen was they would have a scout car or a motorcycle or a couple of horses move ahead and scout, uh, look for a high point where they could um, observe the attacking forces. And then uh, the troops would dismount troop by troop uh, and they would have a horse handler who would take the mounts to uh, a protected position while the men uh, formed lines or dug trenches and, fire and, and worked as a firing line. And they did this by troop by troop. Um, troops, a to, uh, troops A to D were uh, riflemen. Troop E was a machine gun troop. Troop F was also a rifle troop. Um, so... Uh, this is what happened. Uh, as they got to the Mortis, um, their uh, commander, Pierce, was on a motorcycle, went up the hill and saw the Japanese invasion fleet and immediately deployed his uh, troops to fire to, into firing lines. And um, the thing about uh, the, initial, the initial encounters with the Japanese by the Philippine scouts is that since the Philippine scouts were using Garands, uh, they were firing semi-automatic rifles with eight-round clips. The Japanese had um, Arisakas that were firing from five-round clips. Uh, so the weight of fire that hit the Japanese was immediately very heavy. And um, the Japanese unit that uh, they opposed faltered, and then uh, Troop E came up, deployed its machine guns, and they were holding the Japanese back. Um, unfortunately, the Japanese tanks arrived, uh, so um, it turns out that the Japanese were very cautious uh, with their tanks. Um, they had seen that they always assumed that there were anti-tank guns over the next hill. Uh, so they, they kept their fire, but they never approached. 
And so um, more and more, the Japanese fire uh, got worse. Uh, artillery was employed, aircraft were employed, uh, to the point that uh, the cavalrymen, after having stopped the Japanese uh, and protecting the Filipino troops that were retreating, um, had to redeploy. And so uh, Pierce called for the men to uh, withdraw, and they do this again, troop by troop. They get on their horses, uh, the others providing a shell of fire uh, until they can get out. Now, the thing is, the retreat from the Mortis was one of the worst things that ever happened to the 26 Philippine scouts because um, they had never been in combat. And as they were retreating, the Japanese decided to shell them. Uh, and um, horses panicked, riders were thrown off the horses, they were overrun by their own horses. Uh, artillery was uh, did a lot of damage, um, and some of the horses actually ran headlong into the tanks or were run over by the tanks. Uh, it was a real mess. Um, there are images of uh, there are descriptions of uh, Philippine cavalrymen passing, uh, seeing their their seeing their own comrades who had been trampled over, or uh, their horses who were you know headless or with their uh, intestines mm -hmm. coming out and um, it was a disaster it was a total rout uh, a lot of accounts say that um, the 26th cavalry or some of their troops lost as much as 40% uh, to 50% of their men and horses Wow! so that was their baptism of fire both uh, not very good but Pierce was able to observe that his men uh, were still under fire after all, uh, Philippine scouts were trained as marksmen. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, they saw the effect on the Japanese. They eventually had to retreat because of the way the fire and suffered terrible, terrible losses. Troop A itself lost half of its horses. So the tanks were withdrawn, and uh, Troop E actually had the bad luck of having dispersed uh, in front of attacking Japanese tanks. Uh the tax run in uh, well there the 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 horses actually um, suffered running into even the American tanks. So with the help of the officers, cohesion was regained. These were very professional soldiers. Um, as uh, the twenty sixth cavalry was was retreating down the road, the officers stopped the men, got them back in order, and despite their losses, uh, they were able to retreat in order. The next block was the Apangat River. The Apangat River was not yet among the stop lines that um, Wainwright was supposed to was supposed to hold during the retreat. It was just a river heading down south from uh, from the Mortis, mm -hmm. and there, uh, the Japanese with the Japanese in hot pursuit, um, they had to figure out a way to stop the Japanese from crossing this bridge, and uh, the horses went ahead. Uh, followed by the scout cars, followed by the uh, veterinary truck of one of the units. So they stopped the veterinary truck, and uh, three officers, so then Vance, Major Trapnell of the uh, scout cars, and Captain Wheeler, uh, went out, had, um, had the driver stop the car, get out, uh, pulled on the brakes in the middle of the bridge, and set it on fire. Uh, the Japanese attempted to cross. Uh, the fire weakened the bridge, and um, I think they lost a tank. Uh, the bridge collapsed, and the Japanese lost a tank that was trying to push the veterinary truck off the bridge. Um, so Wainwright wanted to pull the 26th out on December 22 uh, because of what had happened to them, but that was not to be. Uh, so the withdrawal began to the central plain, and without the armor and the cavalry, the retreat would have very easily devolved into a total rout. Mm -hmm. So Wainwright needed his, uh, his horses and his tanks as a shell force. Uh, and we got, just, we got a question about tanks, uh, a couple right. of questions. People are talking about whether or not the, um, the Japanese tanks or the American tanks are better suited to the terrain. But the particular mm -hmm. question I was going to ask is, is from... Um, uh, Vlad, C is say, Vlad C is saying, Albert, can you comment how the Type 95 matches up against the M3? So you're a bit of a vehicles guy, but of course, although I'm, we, I will ask you to answer that question, it's never mm -hmm. just tank against tank. It's about doctrine. Right. It's about is someone right. being offensive, defensive, it's terrain, it's commanders, it's training, but 
But do you want to address that question? Sure. Uh, tank against tank, um, the 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 uh, M3 was far more reliable. Uh, it had a more powerful gun. Um, it was a heavier tank, uh, better armor than the Type 95 anyway. Uh, but the Type 95 was a nimble little tank on its own. Uh, but you will see later on uh, when we talk about the further encounters, um, the Americans became more confident in the qualities of the M3. Yeah, thanks. Okay. So um, on December 23, the scout cars ambushed a Japanese bicycle company along the Bued River. Um, the Bued River is a river that comes down from the summer capital of the Philippines, which is Baguio. It's a, it's a city in the mountain with pine trees and stuff. And uh, some of the units that had encountered the Japanese had retreated um, up the mountains and were heading down. And uh, the scout cars and some of the horsemen were asked to uh, provide a shell force on the junction road between Baguio and the road heading down into Pangasinan. Uh, some Japanese were um, ambushed in that area, and eventually um, some of the units were able to come down along the road, but were in no condition to hold and fight. Okay. And another question for you. Sorry to interrupt you, but you, sure. no you earlier you mentioned jungles and you mentioned pine trees there. Would you yes. just give us a little bit of an explanation about what we would call a typical jungle in the Philippines? Because if there's one thing we've learned on World War II TV is there's there's no such thing as a standard jungle. You've got kunai grass on the Guadalcanal, uh, New Guinea, and the, the Kokoda Track is one type of jungle. You've got so so for those who've never been anywhere near the Philippines, including me, what what sort? What sort of jungle is it in the Philippines? And is it one type or is it changed depending on where you are? Uh, it depends on the altitude. Um, right. A lot of the, on the central plain, we hardly have any jungle. Um, if you look back at our past, uh, we had a galleon trade with, uh, with Mexico and uh, a lot of the trees were felled to, to, to build galleons. But in the mountainous areas, we have thick rainforest, but we also have alpine forest. Right. Uh, but most of it is rainforest. Uh, during the American during the American period in the 1930s, um, a lot of the areas around American bases were actually reforested. Uh, so, if you go, for example, to Subic Bay, uh, uh, where the American naval base were was, um, it's also very, very heavily forested, very, very thick, uh, hot, humid, um, the kind of the kind of uh, jungle you see in movies. Right. Yeah. Thank so, you. Uh, so the 26th uh, was guarding the road down from the summer capital and uh, to guard against Japanese uh, attempts to get in the way and block retreating Philippine army troops. Okay, And at this point, um, Wainwright suddenly gets the message, this is I think December 23, that War Plan Orange 3 is under effect. So at this point, is the only time where they discover that we're not beating them on the beaches. We don't have any plans. Uh, we, are, we are reverting to War Plan Orange 3. Now, the interesting thing about this is War Plan Orange 3 was written in the 1930s. Orange was the code word for uh, war against Japan. Um, so War Plan Orange 3 uh, denoted a set of five stop lines uh, from... Uh, Pangasinan, yes, they knew the Japanese were going to were gonna attack through Pangasinan. Um, all of them a day's march from the other, right? Yeah, so, uh, as they would have it, um, all of these Philippine army troops that were uh retreating would basically uh stop for the day and move at night because the Japanese uh ruled the air. Um, and ideally, each stop on that line, we'll see it later, was uh, one day's march. Okay. So D1 was Aguilar to the Zambales foothills. The Zambales foothills are those mountains that we saw earlier in the slide. Yep. D2 is the Agno River. It's a very large river, very wide, but it is shallow in places and can easily be forded by men. Uh, four, feet, four feet deep in some places. Uh, D3... Zambales Mountains again to San Jose. It's like a middle line. D4, Tarlac goes into the next province. Uh, and D5 uh, was denoted as the fortified stop line. Okay, so the fortified stop line was the last chance 
for the troops from the southern Luzon force to come up through the Pampanga uh, province, through Manila or around Manila, and go back into Bataan. Okay, so there are two routes along uh, D1 to D5, uh, traveling north to south. Uh, route 3 was the western highway, and Route 5 was the eastern highway. And the northern Luzon force and southern Luzon force were supposed to meet in San Fernando, Pampanga, just off D5. So on December 23, uh, the 192nd Armor reaches Pozorubio, Rosario, and goes behind the retreating 21st, 11th, and 91st Philippine Army Divisions. Uh, these are no longer in a route. Uh, you will find that as the, as the retreat is going on, the Philippine Army units uh, gain more, more, more and more confidence and experience as they retreat. They already decimated 26th Cavalry, again, from the rear guard, despite their losses. Uh, in the town of Sison, uh, this is still on stop line one, even before stop line one. The 71st Division, which was already mangled badly uh, in the north, uh, formed trenches, rifle pits, MG nests. The 71st Engineers had roadblocks. They had uh, field artillery using 155 millimeter uh, GPFs, old French guns from World War One. The 26th rode through it and left its machine gun troop uh, to defend the city. The 91st Regimental Combat Team, which was one of the better prepared units, was heading north from Cabanatuan on Route 5 in order to relieve the retreating Philippine units. Uh, the 91st, unfortunately, did not reach season on time. So, uh, Wainwright drove up to Pozorubio to control the fleeing troops, stopped in the middle of the highway, uh, and again, um, tried to get some sort of order uh, into the troops that were retreating down the highway. By 3 p.m., the Japanese took season, and the 26th was sent south to Binalonan. Now, Binalonan was what... Uh, Wainwright later on would call a classic uh, cavalry operation. Uh, this was on de December 24. On 4.30 a.m., uh, the scout cars again ambushed Japanese bicycle troops. Bicycle troops are always the, the warning that the Japanese are, 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 are sending tanks and larger, larger units down. Uh, Pierce, uh, the 26th Cavalry commander, deployed his troops in deep irrigation ditches, providing instant trenches, so he was lucky. And uh, the Japanese approached again with infantry and tanks. Um, the first attack was turned away by a couple of Molotov cocktails. Uh, the second Japanese attack, a couple of hours later, was a full-on Banzai charge like they would do later on in Bataan. Mm -hmm. um, and the scouts, being the disciplined soldiers they were, waited 100 till the Japanese were 100 yards away, selected their targets as they were coming in, and enfiladed the Japanese as they were coming in. Uh, 9 a.m., the third Japanese attack came in and was defeated at the same way. And the strange thing about this is the observation was that the Japanese had never made any attempt to outflank the scouts' position during this entire time. Now, Wainwright uh, was concerned, as I said earlier, about his uh, cavalrymen and decided to check out what was going on uh, in Binalonan. And like a cavalryman, they say, uh, he went to the sound of the guns. The 71st that had set up a roadblock had uh, vanished, and Wainwright parked his uh, Packard staff car 400 yards from where the Japanese were to have a chat with his men. Um, he was, his car was hidden behind a bamboo, uh, a bamboo thicket, uh, and word spread among the Filipino defenders that Wainwright was there, thus raising their morale. Uh, Again, um, at Binalonan, the, the town that they were defending, uh, the third attack came. The Japanese tried to shift their axis uh, and then suddenly stopped. Uh, the cavalry retreated in phased withdrawal once again. The Japanese, uh, none the wiser, knowing that the caval uh, not knowing that the cavalrymen had been uh, saddling their horses, preparing to leave. So much like the British... Uh, uh, retreat from Arnhem. They would have a shell force. They would come forward, fire a bit, and then uh, the troops would leave in phases. Um, so by 3 p.m., the Japanese, uh, the next Japanese attack, the fourth attack of the day at Binalonan, the bulk of the northern Luzon force was at D2, and the Philippine scouts were gone. Uh, 
it is said that the 71st division was hit so badly that they could not hold. Um, the 26th, the 26th moved to Tayog, which was a town in the east, and slept for the first time in three days. Uh, there were several other roadblocks uh, south of the Agno River. The Japanese attempted to cross the Agno River at several places, uh, some using infantry, some using tanks. Um, some of the Japanese tanks uh, tried to get across. Uh, the engines died, and Philippine scouts uh, swam across and uh, crowbarred the turret hatches open and threw grenades in. So the Japanese were again stopped uh, at D2 at the Agno River. Um, so while this is all happening, all the Filipino divisions are going down uh, through Route 3 and Route 5, the Japanese in hot pursuit. Um, the 11th Division was in danger of being outflanked uh, as they were moving south. And um, as a matter of fact, the Japanese had gotten through to D3, uh, to, to, sorry, to Route 3, and there was no way that the 11th Division could drive through. So what they did was they basically remembered that there was a running train uh, serving uh, Tarlac to the north, and basically they took a train uh, down south and avoided attack. Um, so the 26th was again asked to cover the 91st Division and not withdraw. They, 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 list, they heard this order several times, do not withdraw until the last moment. Um, the 192nd uh, C Company was asked to join them. Um, and so, uh, again, the horses and the tanks were together. Uh, the Japanese eventually made their way across the Agno River, but by then, the rest of the Philippine forces were already at D2. Um, the Japanese tried again. They eventually got across, but uh, the first two tanks that had gotten across were ambushed. The tank commanders were standing out in the open turrets, as they would probably do at night. Uh, they were shot, and grenades were again thrown into the hatches. The night of December 25th, the entire NLF was in position at D2. So the Northern Luzon Force was safe in position at D2. The scouts received orders to finally retreat to D5 and rest. D3 was held for only one day, and D4 was reached in good order on December 29. Mm -hmm. The provisional tank group was now deployed on the extreme west and the extreme east of D4. Question for you, Albert. I'll give you a break to compose you. You've been, you've been talking and it's been brilliant. But Peter O'Connor is asking again, you know, as, as, as other people have said, you're not going to win a war by defending well and evacuating out. But they, nevertheless, they, they are putting up a really stubborn defense. And we know that the Japanese over, underestimated the, 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 the Filipino resistance later on. So the question is, how did the Japanese concept of their morale and cultural superiority fa fare in the face of the determined resistance and reverses inflicted on them uh, by Allied forces? Because, you know, we know in Singapore they're having massive success there. This is, this is it's not going as well for them as, as it was elsewhere. Not at all, we not know at what all. Japanese morale, how, how they were being affected by this? At this point, not yet. Uh, Japanese morale would start to suffer... Uh, during the Bataan campaign. But as, right, you, right. as you know, the Japanese General Homa was operating on a strict timeline. And yeah. he was the only general who did not fulfill that timeline. Uh, on the personal basis, the Japanese feelings of cultural superiority, that would be revealed later on during the death march. Uh, remember, the, the, the Japanese, uh, it, it's a fate worse than death to surrender. And that was meted out on Philippine and American uh, prisoners during the death march. Um, okay. So uh, this brings us to the first successful land, uh, tank battle of U.S. forces in World War II, which was the Battle of Baliwag. Let me move forward. I've gone on and talked so much that I've forgotten to uh, forward my slides. Okay, We're so loving you, it. Don't worry. If you look at the map on the lower uh, mid-right, there's a little town uh, called Baliwag that's in the province of Bulacan. There, there's an X. There's a little X on the lower uh, mid-right. And you see the uh, tactical symbol of the 192nd uh, Tank Battalion. Okay. So um, the entire uh, retreat is going very well. Uh the Northern Luzon force is managing not to be routed by the Japanese. They've been outflanked at certain points, but they're always quick enough or the forces are always lucky enough to get away. 
Um, Baliwag was entered on the evening of December 29th. Um, two Philippine divisions, the 91st and 71st remnants after they were utterly destroyed, uh, were told to occupy it. Uh, and for some reason, and this has never been explained, one bridge, a railroad bridge, had remained into the town of Baliwag. And um, they realized, uh, Bill Gentry realized, who was in charge of the Stewart tanks there, uh, realized that that would funnel the Japanese into the center of the town. And Baliwag is a little, little town. It's a big city now, but it's a little town with narrow streets. And he saw an opportunity for an ambush. Um, so he placed his uh, Stewart tanks. This is, a, this is based on a map that was actually uh, drawn by Bill Gentry. Um, here you see the, on the upper left, you see the bridge uh, moving into town. It was a railway bridge, so the Japanese would need to take time to repair it and to place planks across it so their tanks could come across. Uh, and he was, he was in an observation post watching all of the movement. The Japanese were clear in the open. Uh, so he placed um, his tanks on a line uh, immediately facing the bridge. You can see his tanks there at the, at the lower center um, of the map. And then uh, Second Lieutenant Kennedy uh, was on the far side of the town facing inwards, basically forming an L-shaped ambush. Uh, the Japanese, they waited and waited and waited. They saw the Japanese infantry move into town as the Filipino infantry moved out. And... Um, Oh, what's not shown here is the SPMs and the uh, 71st uh, Philippine, Inf uh, Philippine Artillery Division. Uh, the SPMs and the 71st uh, Artillery of the Philippine 71st Division were also overwatching this bridge. And so as they were waiting for something to happen, a jeep drove into Lieutenant Gendry's uh, command post and they saw through their binoculars that the Japanese suddenly got very busy. So uh, they felt that they had been spotted. The Japanese had already entered the town. And so uh, Gentry's uh, stewards moved forward. They were hidden under houses. Uh, in, in, in the Philippine provinces, you can see houses made of uh, nipa, which is a kind of palm front. Um, they're about... Uh, eight feet high, so you can actually park a tank under. And Gentry had hidden tanks, his tanks under the houses and covered them with uh, with uh, bamboo. So the Japanese were under observation and had absolutely no idea they were there. Uh, Gentry moved forward and immediately knocked out two Japanese Type 89 tanks, uh, after which his tanks followed and Lieutenant Kennedy moved in to attack. The Japanese decided to hide out within the narrow streets and what happened was um, the uh, maneuverability and superiority of the Stuart tank showed itself uh, because the, it was basically the Stuarts chasing the Japanese all over the place. Um, the Philippine, Filipino infantry had left uh, so that the, the Stuarts could not uh, engage the Japanese with their cannons. So what basically happened was a Stuart tank has among the most machine guns of an American tank in World War II. They have four. Uh, some of them had three because the radios were, were, were put in to replace the machine guns. And basically, um, they, uh, they attacked the Japanese infantry by rolling around and shooting everywhere they could. Basically, the Japanese unit that had crossed was completely decimated. Um, so Gentry's tanks ran over the Japanese guns that were also deployed there. Uh, eight Japanese tanks were uh, destroyed. Uh, this is a very important action because the town of Baliwag blocked where the South Luzon force would pass around Manila in order to withdraw into Bataan. And just as the Battle of Baliwag was happening, the Southern Luzon force was making its way around. Uh, had this battle not happened, the Japanese would have been able to come straight through and possibly mm -hmm. block uh, General Parker's troops as they were coming up. Uh, the other thing was it gave the American press a big boost. Uh, there were newspaper articles claiming uh, 10 little tanks spitting death. Uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, the Kalumpit Bridge was the bridge through which the Southern Luzon force 
uh, passed through, and at 6.15 on January the 1st, uh, the Kalumpit Bridge was blown. Uh, on December 30, a further five Type 89s were knocked out by uh, a company of the 192nd. By December 27, the roads to Bataan were full. There was an eight-mile-long convoy of troops all dashing into Bataan. There were buses, trucks, ox carts, civilians, what have you. Uh, the 26th marched out of Mexico, Pampanga. As, as If you recall, the 26th was resting. Yeah. Uh, and they were again given a task uh, by Wainwright uh, to cover the retreat of the 21st and 11th divisions held in line at the towns of Porak and Guagua. This is already approaching into the entrance of Bataan. Uh, here's a little tidbit that very few people know. Um, a British uh, freighter called the Don Jose, uh, a freighter called the Don Jose, carrying Canadian equipment that was bound for uh, Hong Kong to equip the, the troops in Hong Kong. Uh, was carrying 57 uh, universal carriers or Bren gun carriers. Uh, they were stopped in Manila because Hong Kong had fallen. Uh, and basically, the Bren gun carriers were offloaded and uh, were distributed among uh, the uh, provisional tank group, the 26th Cavalry, and uh, some went to Philippine constabulary units. Um, it, it, it's interesting how well... No, well, knowledgeable the World War II TV viewers are because this came up in the show a couple of days ago. Someone in the sidebar said, are these the carriers that were Canadian that were on their way to Hong Kong? So yeah, yeah. The, the, the knowledge level of you, the, the sidebar warriors out there is, is incredible. So yeah, it's maybe not known to some people, but you guarantee That's some great. of the World War II TV people do because they're, they're a knowledgeable great. bunch. So uh, the 26th was deployed on the left flank between, the Por between Porak and the Zambales Mountains to protect the left flank. Oh, sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. To protect the left flank of uh, the uh, 11th and 21st Divisions. By this time, uh, these divisions were already uh, used to battle. And uh, the Japanese struck directly at the 21st at Porak. Uh, the Japanese were stopped completely by massive artillery from the 21st uh, field artillery. On January 2 as well, the Japanese entered Manila. Manila, as you know, was uh, declared an open city by MacArthur. Um, we don't know if Homa knew what sort of struggle in Bataan awaited him. And so Manila was always the prize to him up until the Japanese entered Bataan. Uh, on dawn of January 3, the Japanese pulled away from the left flank uh, and attacked uh, the 21st Division again. And this is where General Kapinpin, the commander of the 21st Division, told his men, hold the line or die where you are. Mm -hmm. The Japanese also struck the 11th Division, but as January 3 ended, the line was intact. Both Philippine Army Divisions held. Uh, at 3.30, under intense Japanese fire and air attack, the 11th began to fall back and the 26th withdrew, not under Japanese fire for once, through the mountain passes. The final retreat to Bataan started on January 5. Um, by mid-morning of January 5, the 21st had held the line. Uh, troops E and F, meanwhile, uh, merged, uh, were merged by the 26th. And uh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself again. Um, and so uh, the entire NLF, in fact, the entire USAFE was uh, already um, was already uh, retreating into the Bataan Peninsula. Uh, interesting thing about this is uh, General Wainwright himself again went out to check his lines, and he inadvertently crossed into the Japanese lines. Luckily, a Filipino soldier told him that he had done so and hurried his way back. Uh, the 26th again saw action using its Bren gun carriers for the first time at Hermo Hermosa, ambushing a Japanese column. Guarding Route 74, the 26th heard a faint rumble that grew progressively louder. Uh, the NLF began its mass withdrawal into Bataan. They thought it was Japanese tanks, but basically it was the entire northern Luzon force passing them. The objective was to get to the bridge across the Kulo River before the Japanese did. So this was like a race. Mm -hmm. Wainwright and his chief engineer drove to the northern, e northern end of the span, determined to greet the troops coming in. 
Pierce once again deployed his uh, time-honored withdrawal in phases, firing at the Japanese, withdrawing to the horses, leaving another shell to fire. And at 10.30, the 11th uh, Philippine Army Division was across. The 21st Division followed it soon after. Its commanding officer, Kapin Pin, stepped off and joined Wainwright at the bridge. At 12.30 on December 26, the flood of troops slackened. Five M3s, uh, followed by three mounted troops, followed. Uh, Trapnel waved to uh, General Wainwright as troops E and F followed and said, Sir, to the best of my knowledge, all units of the 21st Division have cleared the junction. Our last steward tank drove past, giving the men a scare. And at 2 p.m., Wainwright himself ordered, blow it. So um, the reason why I became so interested in this process was uh, back in 2013, I think, uh, the Philippine Scouts Heritage Society um, held a reunion. Uh, a lot of these men were living in the States at the time, and they took one last uh, trip to the Philippines. Uh, and I got to meet all of them, and I got to listen to their stories about how, how it felt to actually be there. Uh, the guy in the middle, uh, Arshaga, was uh, actually one of the first men to see the Japanese in Pangasinan. He was given... Uh, he was given a job to reconnoiter the positions on a motorcycle, and he heard Japanese singing in the hills. <laughs> so uh, his, as he told me his story, his hands were shaking in mine, and I'll always remember that. Um, so I hope I, I was able to give a little bit of sense about what the, what the retreat into Bataan from Pangasinan was like. Uh, and I'll end with this really awkward picture of Wainwright and MacArthur. Uh, yeah, and, and and thank you very much for an outstanding presentation. And I think that that's the narrative most, but not not the World War Two TV crowd because they know everything. But most people's narrative is is just of Wainwright very much as a victim, you know, left behind by MacArthur, and then that image there of him being very thin, and then of course the the, the fact he was decorated after war and, and but didn't live, well, he died ten years after war or something, right. didn't he? So. But I think this middle story of this of this epic retreat and hold, retreat and, and hold and defend is is a story that should be known better than it is because it, it goes against the narrative we have of the Japanese, um, the swiftness of their of their thorough occupation of all these. Exactly. Kind of, you know, we, we just talk about this almost um, steamroller of Japanese movement across the the, the Pacific, and and, of, and, of, and in places there was this, albeit ultimately meaningless defense. I don't mean meaningless in a negative way. I mean, it, the bravery of the people there, the sacrifice there, but it didn't actually stop anything. But it right. nevertheless, it, show, it sowed the seeds for the eventual victory later. It showed that sense of determination. It showed togetherness. It, it gave the, the guerrilla fighters, I'm, I'm assuming, something to hold on to later on. You know, two, you know, a year and a half later when the, the, the liberators are, are a long way away, I, I, I guess I'm guessing looking back, on these early victories that they're not really victories, but they're the honorable encounters was something they could look back on with pride. A lot of people say that, uh, you know, uh, there used to be a narrative that the, the, that the action in Bataan uh, broke the Japanese timeline. And a lot of people say, well, it's not really true because the Japanese did not have full intention of invading Australia. Um, but what, it did was it gave the allies in the Pacific hope that yeah. these guys could actually be beaten. Um, and it's if, interesting. Yeah, the, the in, their invincibility, the Japanese yeah. invincibility has been shown to not be quite what it is. Exactly. And, and, and there, of course, there are lots of cases of the Japanese just sweeping aside allied units across at the same time of this. But this is a things didn't go well for them. Um, so, but we're, we're in danger of going down a rabbit hole of talking about later things. I'm going mean, to invite you back at some other point in the future to talk about more about the Philippines, but a couple of questions that came in. Sure. You mentioned Japanese air superiority. superiority. So Lisa is asking, did they use it much against Wainwright's men in, and the, and in, these, in the withdrawals? That's an interesting question because I, I, I was asking exactly the same question myself. And it would seem uh, that number one, uh, Japanese air power was not exactly what it was uh, during the campaign. The Japanese had heavy bombers, but they were bombing cities. 
uh, most of the Japanese aircraft that were in action against uh, the retreat were basically scout and reconnaissance aircraft. Mm -hmm. uh, the Zero had not even made much of an appearance by that yeah. time. Uh, the Japanese were fly flying the A5M Claude. Uh, and the Japanese army bombers were very, very light. Uh, they, they, were, they were not exactly the equivalent of like a Stuka or something like that. Also, there were times when um, the weather did not cooperate. Yeah. Uh, on the final retreat from uh, D4 to D5, the entire day was cloudy. The Japanese were not able to fly. Mm -hmm. Great answer. I'm assuming also they had some predetermined targets as well. They're still right. thinking about logistics and, and airfields and things acro across the, 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 the wider Pacific. And maybe reacting to this kind of force was something they were they were unprepared to do. The other question we've got is um, John McManus talked about the incredible asset Filipino guerrillas were in planning the eventual Allied return in 44, 45 and that knowledge there. But uh, the opposite way of putting the question, Kevin is asking: Did the, prior to the Japanese, did the Japanese have any spies on the islands? Did they get information oh, yes. from the Philippines? Yes, yes. Um, if you talk to old folks here, uh, a lot of them will say, "Well, I had a Japanese neighbor; he was a gardener, and then uh, all of a sudden, he's he's a he's, he's a colonel in full uniform." Um, so a lot of spies, like what they had in uh, like what they had in uh, in Hawaii at the time, and. If you remember Davao in the south of the Philippines, in Mindanao, had a huge Japanese population. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of these guys were actually pre-placed. Pre brilliant. Thank you. Well, that's it. Other than people are saying how how brilliant it's been and how and um, how how great the presentation has been. And for someone who was a bit nervous before going into this, you you played a blinder there. So I'm really 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 <laughs> pleased with it. So Albert. Um, you'll be getting an invitation to come back, and uh, your your your, your explanation has been fantastic. Your your model making skills have also been fantastic there, and you talked about tanks. You talked about everything so fantastic. Um, uh, we will leave things there, folks. I'm back again in whatever it is six hours time. Mark Stilly is going to be doing the second part of his Lady Golf show. Show so we are going into the Navy. We talked with Donald Manners about how the the Philippines is just as a lot more than Navy fighting. But you can't ignore the naval battle. So we're going to do the second part of this Lady Golf show. And then tomorrow, Tony's on to talk about the defenses in Corregidor and Manila Bay. And that'll be that. And then um, lots more to come. Uh, so, folks, everybody, thank you very much for your attention this afternoon or this evening, depending on where you are. Albert, thank you very much for a fantastic so presentation. And pleasure. I will see you all next time. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Okay.